All right, today we are going to uh, do an introduction to the judicial branch. Oops, there we go. Um, the basis of the federal judiciary can be found in the Constitution. Specifically, the third article sets up the Supreme Court. Um, however, the first article says that Congress has the power to make every other court in the judiciary aside from the, the Supreme Court, and that's kind of all the Constitution says about it. We actually have two levels of courts um, in the United States. We have the state and the federal court system. The state court system deals with um, trial courts, appeals courts, and then they usually have a state supreme court or a high court. Um, trial courts deal with civil and criminal cases. Civil cases are things like um, business contracts, um, breach of contracts, divorces, adoptions, things like that. And you guys know what criminal cases are. Um, appeals courts hear appeals from those trials. And then the state Supreme Court has the last word on state law. This is a nice flow chart to demonstrate how state versus federal courts work together. For the federal court, it's a pretty straight line. You have U.S. District Courts, the Court of Appeals or the Circuit Courts, and then the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, with state, it's a bit more complex because they hear more types of courts. So you have your small claims courts, your trial courts, appellate courts for the trial courts. Uh, then there's the high courts or the state supreme courts. And then sometimes things from the state supreme courts can make their way to the U.S. Supreme Court if the U.S. Supreme Court decides to accept a seratory, a writ of seratory. I'm probably butchering how to say that. I've never actually figured out how to say it. I'm embarrassed to say. Anyway. Uh, the federal Supreme Court has two types of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is just a court's authority to hear a case. Um, they have original and appellate. Um, so appellate means they can hear appeals cases. Um, original jurisdiction, uh, the Supreme Court does have some original jurisdiction, and that's laid out in the Constitution in Article 3. They have original jurisdiction if a state is involved in a lawsuit. Um, or an ambassador or a public minister of the federal government is involved in a suit. Uh, they also have original jurisdiction over piracy and crimes committed on the high seas, things like that. Um, however, most of their cases come from the lower federal courts or the high state courts. So most of their cases are appellate. Um, the federal court system has, again, three levels. There's the district courts, the circuit courts, or the court of appeals, and the U.S. Supreme Courts. The federal district courts deal with federal crimes. Um, kidnapping, carjacking, tax evasion, mail fraud. Remember the the federal government controls the post office, so anything like even minor things like uh, ripping down someone's mailbox is technically a federal offense that would go to a federal court. Um, the U.S. Court of Appeals um, is the second level that they hear appeals from the lower district courts, um, and this set of courts, the Court of Appeals, is called circuit courts also. Uh, and then there's the U.S. Supreme Court. They hear all, they hear appeals from all of their courts, the highest court in the land, and when they make a decision, it's final. Um, here is a map of the federal appeals courts or the circuit courts. We're in the Fourth Circuit, as you can see. That's why a few years ago, when a Virginia circuit judge said that um, same-sex marriage was constitutional, we had to change our state laws, even though our state constitution had an amendment forbidding same-sex marriage. Um, the Ninth Circuit Court over here on this coast is the one that just um, struck down Trump's Muslim ban um, last month. Um, so a little bit of background about the justices. Usually they're white, usually they're male. The vast majority of them throughout history have been white and male. However, there are some exceptions and they're becoming more common. Thurgood Marshall, Clarence Thomas are two black justices um, that we've had. And Sonia Sotomayor is the first Hispanic justice that we had. Um, she's from Puerto Rico, and she was put in under Obama. Usually they're male, again, but there are some exceptions. We have had four Supreme Court justices that are women. Three of them are currently on the Supreme Court. They're Sandra Day O'Connor, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan. Usually lawyers, they usually have political experience. They are um, the most well-qualified people in the federal government. Um, and usually they come from the same party as the president that appoints them. All federal judges must be confirmed by the Senate. That's Supreme Court, Circuit Courts, all of those. 
Federal judges, all of them, have lifelong tenures. You can be impeached for bad behavior, but it's not very common. Um, so what are qualities of a good justice? Well, these are the things that they take into consideration when uh, selecting um, a justice. Do they have judicial competence? Do they have a good track record uh, with cases? What is their ideology? Um, and then also it's becoming increasingly more important to look at gender, racial, ethnic, or religious backgrounds. Um, because the Supreme Court, as it stands right now, has has been becoming more and more diverse in those areas. Um, and it, it's seen by most presidents and, and most people as a generally a positive thing. Um, so this is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. His name is John Roberts. He was appointed under George W. Bush in 2005. He's Catholic. Uh, this is Anthony Kennedy. Um, he was appointed by Ronald Reagan in 88. I believe he's also Catholic. This is Clarence Thomas. He was appointed under George H.W. Bush in 1991. Uh, there was a weird controversy around his um, um, Senate hearing, confirmation hearing. Uh, it's kind of gross. If you're interested, you can Google it. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was appointed under Bill Clinton in 1993. She was the second woman to be appointed to the court. Um, and she's Jewish. Then there's Stephen Breyer. He was appointed under Bill Clinton in 1994. Samuel Alito, I believe, is also Catholic, but I might be wrong there. I probably should have looked that up before I <laughs> just started talking. He was appointed under George W. Bush in 2006. Uh, and fun fact, my roommate met him uh, a few months ago because he was in Asheville touring the Thomas Wolfe House where she works, and I was really jealous that she got to meet a Supreme Court justice, and I did not. Uh, Sonia Sotomayor is my favorite because we share the same first name, and she just seems like an awesome lady. She was appointed under Barack Obama. She was his first appointee. She was appointed back in 2009, and she's the first Hispanic justice. Elena Kagan was also appointed by Barack Obama a year later. Uh, then there's Antonin Scalia, who is no longer on the Supreme Court because he died last year. You probably remember that. It was a pretty big deal. He was appointed under Ronald Reagan in 1986. And he's probably going to be replaced by this guy, Neil Gorsuch, who has not been nominated by Trump recently, but he hasn't been approved yet. Um, there are two types of justice ideology. There's strict versus constructionist interpretation. So that's should the Constitution be interpreted literally or not. And then... Um, so the strict interpretation is, yes, it should, but the liberal interpretation views the Constitution as a living document that should be interpreted for the times. Um, the ideological makeup of the Supreme Court of the U.S. Um, basically looks like this. You have your more liberal judges here on the left. Um, Kennedy tends to be the most moderate. He was appointed under a conservative president, but he does tend to be more moderate. He's kind of a swing vote, usually. The more conservative judges are here on the right. And probably, if Gorsuch is approved, he'll fall over here. But who knows? When Reagan appointed Sandra Day O'Connor, he appointed her um, knowing that she had a record of being kind of a conservative judge. Uh, and then she turned out to be pretty activist and pretty liberal once being appointed to the Supreme Court. There they all are together. Look at how cute she is. She's my favorite over here. Real Ruthie. Um... So what does the Supreme Court do exactly? Judicial review. Well, what does that mean? They review laws and executive orders for constitutionality. The court, of course, first asserted its power of judicial review um, under um, Marbury versus Madison. Uh, that was under the first Supreme Court Chief Justice, John Marshall, and he claimed the right of the Supreme Court to declare acts of Congress unconstitutional. Um, the power of a court to review the constitutionality of law was also written about in the Federalist Number 78, which you all should be reading this weekend. Uh, the term of a Supreme Court begins by statute or law on the first Monday in October, and it lasts until late June or early July. Each term is divided between two sittings, so two weeks, and then two recesses, or, or and then recesses, which are for two weeks. So you have two weeks on and two weeks off between October to June or July. Uh, the Supreme Court usually hears 20 to 24 cases per sitting. During the sittings, they have oral arguments first, and there's a recess period where the justices study and argue amongst themselves um, and then write their opinions. And there are two types of opinions, dissenting or uh, majority. Um, there's technically more than that, but those are the basic ones. 
uh, during a, uh, a recess period, all of this work gets done. Uh, each week, the justices must also evaluate more than 130 petitions, or certs as they're called, seeking um, to have a case heard by the Supreme Court. Um, they actually have a ton of cases that are submitted to them, but they only hear a very small portion of them. Uh, here's this word again. Uh, the petition for the writ of seratory, um, which they call a cert petition, and I never know if I'm saying seratory right, and probably not. That's a document in which a losing party files with the Supreme Court, asking the Supreme Court to review and basically at, at appeal a decision from the lower court. A writ of seriatory is a decision made by the Supreme Court to hear an appeal from a lower court. In most cases come to the Supreme Court via a cert petition. Then there's the rule of four. This is very important, so pay attention to this part. Judges review the certs, and when four out of usually nine justices agree to hear it, then it's put on a docket, which is just a schedule, um, and then they'll hear that case. <clears throat> Oops. There we go. I don't know what's going on. Um, so briefs are written documents that are filed with the court before oral, oral arguments begin. They support one side of the case or another, and sometimes briefs are written by like interest groups or PACs or things like that. Um, the Solicitor General, who represents the United States in all Supreme Court cases, decides which cases the government asks to be reviewed and what the government's stance on the cases would be. If the Chief Justice is in the majority on a case, he assigns the writing of the opinion to one of the other justices, but he can also write it himself too if he wants. The majority opinion is the opinion overall of the court, but sometimes justices don't agree with the majority opinion, so if they, if not all the justices agree, then they can write a dissenting opinion. However, it's the majority opinion that matters. Um, pretty much every Supreme Court case ever, with the exception of Bush versus Gore, set a precedent. That means that it's an example and that similar cases as they arise in lower courts will follow the Supreme Court's lead. Um, they can be broken, like with Betts or Gideon, um, or like Brown versus Board overturned Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, other types of opinions, again, are dissenting. Those are the ones where justices don't agree with the ruling. There is another one, it's called a concurring opinion. It's when a Supreme Court justice technically agrees with the majority opinion, but not necessarily with the argument that got to that point. So it's another argument that's slightly different from the one that was chosen to represent the court. Um, remember that a minority opinion of today be could become the court's majority position in the future. So they're not necessarily that important, but they are kept on file and other judges and other cases do pay attention to them. Plessy and Brown are good examples of um, how a dissenting opinion from one case influenced the majority opinion in another. This is your flipped assignment. There's only one. I'm going to attach a handout that explains more clearly judicial activism versus restraint. And I want you to find an example of a time that a conservative judge acted in an activist role or a time that a liberal judge acted with restraint. The example that I'm going to give you now to give you a baseline to go off of is when Justice Scalia, who is conservative, wrote the majority opinion on um, the Second Amendment, arguing that it does mean that Americans have the right to own guns. That is a conservative judge acting in an activist role, expanding the meaning of the Constitution. All right, that's all for tonight. I will see you all tomorrow.